All right, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, for those who don't uh, know who I am, my name is Rob Schwartz. I am a, I guess you'd say I'm an independent college counselor with Premier College Guidance, and I'm a faculty member in the UCLA College Counseling uh, Certificate Program. Uh, my co-hosts this evening are uh, my partner, Trevor Mizrahi, who's the president at Premier College Guidance and Eric Elfson, who is a college and guidance counselor at Valley Christian School, as well as a national podcaster with Digital Education. I wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, by all means, fire those questions off. We're gonna tackle them as, as best as we can. Uh, again, we're planning on being here for about an hour's time. If we go a little over, no problem. I think we're all probably settled in for the evening. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Eric, what's our first question? Eric, can you hear me? I think we lost Eric. All right, I'll tell you what, I've got, oh, Eric is on the move. Okay, so Eric's on the move. I'll go ahead and uh, pull up the first question. Um, so a student who is a great test taker, has a 1560 on the SAT, how are admissions reps going to deal in a test optional situation? Well. My take is test optional doesn't mean we don't take tests. Uh, plain and simple colleges and universities that you share that information with, they want that information. It's a viable piece of information. Um, how they usually work with standardized tests, that's gonna vary from school to school. Uh, the schools that have fewer values that they look at, like a Cal State University system school that's simply looking at curriculum, grades, test scores, and the major that you've selected, it's a very sizable value. For a small private religious school, that number might be impressive, but it probably counts for less than you would think. Uh, in a test optional universe, every school is gonna use it a little bit differently. But what I can assure you is that value is really strong. Uh, don't have your child take the test again, please. 15, 16, 1600, as far as almost everyone is concerned, is the same thing. Your kid is brilliant in this one area, and that's wonderful, and we don't need to prove anything else. Um, it is, it's certainly a positive. It's certainly not gonna hurt anything. So share that number and feel like it's still gonna hold just as much weight as it did before. Trevor, Eric, you're, Eric, if you're hearing, you're welcome to jump in and share a differing opinion or anything else on the topic. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think, I think, you know, and, and part of one of the questions that was in there as well is, is the selective, as more selective schools go to test optional as well, what's going to happen with some of the tests. And I, I think it'd be interesting to hear from, from you and you and Trevor in particular, I, probably two things that I noticed even in the questions would be, you know, number one, you know, what's going to happen with the tests here going forward. I think that's probably a big question, whether it's spring and into the into the fall, but then I think the second question being, you know, with some of the decisions that the UC came out with yesterday, you know, what does that mean for all of this too? I, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you and Trevor have to think about what's coming up with testing and then the UC decisions about pass fail and some of the other stuff. Trevor, I'll give you the floor. You haven't had it yet. Do you want to cover anything regarding where you see standardized testing going uh, in lieu of the information we've received in the last few days or few weeks? I don't have too much input other than I know that the public schools in Oregon are now dropping them. So, I mean, that's across the board for Oregon's public schools. I think more than anything, students should really kind of think of this time to take advantage of what can they do to build something for an academic resume that they might be able to substitute instead of having a really good test score. And that's just self-exploration to me. That really, that's where I think some time should be spent right now. But not too much to add on the testing front. I think you had it covered. Um, I used to be in test prep. For those who've known me for, you know, 15 years, I started at the Princeton Review. So, you know, I, I had a foot in that arena for a long time. That said, it's been a long time. Um, do I know exactly what's going to come to pass the standardized testing? I don't. Based on what I read, the UC system has made it very clear. And if you read the College Knowledge Quarterly that I just sent out, um, the UC uh, faculty were recommending the keeping of SAT and ACT as part of their decision making. 
namely because they want to create their own exam, but they say it's going to take eight to nine years to create such an exam. So certainly as a stopgap solution to what their goal is, I don't see standardized testing going very far. In terms of most large public universities, I don't see it changing because it is a valuable tool. Do I think it determines how well you're going to do in life? No, it, they're rather silly. Are they biased? Are they unfair? Yes, they are. I don't think anyone's going to debate that. But the fact of the matter is there isn't a better measuring stick in and of itself. So I don't see standardized testing going completely away, but certainly given what we're seeing right now, the college board and the ACT are, are quaking in their boots and they should be. Uh, they're going to have a very, very rough year or two. Uh, and that's if things don't get any worse for them. Uh, if a school system like the UCs pull the plug, maybe standardized tests do go away uh, in terms of admission decisions. I don't see that happening, but who knows? All right, uh, what we have, uh, Eric, what's our next question? Well, I, th I think I think even on the standardized testing thing, you know, as you look at it, as you know, as as Trevor brought up, and and it is that good point where, you know, as juniors in particular, you know, building their you know their resume, their academics, their programming, you know, all of their opportunities, and and we do know, you know, the the place that testing is holding. I agree with you. It is a great you know great measure for success in a lot of ways. I think what, what we just got to watch is the schools like Oregon, you know, and the public schools that would normally um, have a testing, you know, a testing um, would be a testing site and then they've shut down. I think the question would be, you know, are the states going to go into the fall and do testing in the fall? I, I don't necessarily think so. I think it's going to revert back to the old ways where you're going to have to find a Saturday and you're going to have to do some of the, the other things, um, you know, when it comes to that. I think one of the questions, Rob, was was a really interesting question is, you know, is is if I had plans to go visit colleges, right, during this time, right, spring break, spring's a great time, and even summer camps and all those things, if I had an opportunity to go visit colleges, how do I do this virtually? What are the ways in which I can maximize um, just getting to know a college from afar and, you know, and, and virtually? Uh, it's a dynamite question. Um, one of the things that I advise all of my students is, yeah, it would be great under normal circumstances to go and visit every school on your preliminary college list, but that's never going to happen. We don't have the time. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. So what are the next best things we can do when we're looking at a preliminary list of 20 or 30 schools? We have to take virtual tours. We have to use outside information. This should be part of standard operating procedure, by the way, not just the emergency of the coronavirus. This should be standard operating procedure for any student who really wants to understand what they're buying as consumers. And that is what our goal is. Um, there are a number of sites that I'm a fan of. Uh, campusreal.org is a great resource. Uh, University TV, beginning with a Y-O-U, is a great resource. Um, those are the first two that I recommend to my students where you're getting a student-centric perspective of the world through the lens of students who are attending that school. Um, I would encourage reading a couple of really good books that have been around for a long time that are updated regularly, like the Fisk Guide, like Princeton Review's Best Colleges Guide. Rob Frantic and I go way back. Uh, he does a fantastic job with that book each and every year. Um, it's a quick, easy, concise read. Uh, it's a great way to, to really be able to identify what it is that makes a school special for you as an individual. You know, I've had plenty of students who, you know, read reviews and their takeaway is, well, it sounds like a really great school, just not for me. And that's precisely what we're after is we're looking for that, that emotional connection that a student makes when they're, they're reading about professors and they're reading about their fellow students and they're reading about the academic environment and the social environment. And they're going, that sounds exactly where I want to be now seeing is still believing. We should still get out and see these schools whenever possible. And that is, that's one of the great, you know, sadnesses of, of this senior class. I mean, I have a student who, I mean, you talk about crushing it. I mean, crushed it. She applied to 13 schools. She got into 12. Her top three choices are Stanford, Yale, and Chicago. And her problem is she didn't see any of them 
and now she doesn't know what to do. And I know, you know, most of you watching this are they're thinking, boo hoo, you have to choose between Stanford, Yale, and Chicago, Crimea River. But at the same time, I also think it's, it really is important for, for us to recognize that that, that last step is important. Um, no matter how many virtual tours you take, it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that you need to see, not just the school, by the way, you need to be able to see the surrounding community. That's another important part of good college counseling is to encourage families to not just go and take the song and dance tour where you've been sold for 90 minutes, but to explore the surrounding community and get a sense of, well, in your third or your fourth year when you're no longer living on campus, what is this life really going to be like? Do you really fit this community? Where are you going to shop? Where are you going to go and, and to bars and restaurants and movie theaters and all that other stuff? Does this suit who you are as a person? And if it doesn't, I don't care how good the school is, I wouldn't go there. I mean, I have, I have talks all the time about, you know, which UC school should I look at? And as much as I went to UCLA and I'm still employed by UCLA, I still cringe that, you know, people see it as the UC system, like it's all the same thing, when they're all completely different schools and they all have very different character and very different environments. Um, I mean, it's, it's just, it's something to take into consideration. Let me turn this over to, uh, to you guys. Well, I think, I think, you know, one of the things that we do with our students, if they can't get on campus, um, you know, there's a number of suggestions. You, you, you mentioned university, um, and I put that in the link. Rob, what was the other one that you liked? Campus Real, uh, oh, that's right. and it's a .org. Yeah, so campusreal.org. I'd forgotten about that one. So those are two great sites. I think the third thing that I'm seeing with my students and, you know, with the colleges is that they're coming out with virtual tours constantly um, and consistently. And so, you know, in those virtual tours, they're, they're building those out so that then you can see campus, you can, you know, get into some of the, 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 some of the environment of the campus, um, you know, even though the students aren't there. You, you had mentioned other places, you know, like rate my professor, what, you know, what kind of professor am I going to have? Um, I always tell my students is like, listen, just, just, you know, Google map it, right? How would you get there? What's in the community? What's in the neighborhood? What's around? Um, you know, and then what you, the other thing that you always do is, is Google images too, right? Because, you know, what does it look like? And, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, oftentimes come up in those images because then you can start to filter through and say, okay, what does this place look like? And, and even when I put it up, if I put in a college, oftentimes, you know, it's campus that'll come up, the buildings, the facilities, but then sometimes the other, you know, events and organizations and, and those types of things. And I think this is even a time to like dig deep into campus life and get on the websites. And so if there's a, you know, if there's a community that you'd like to be a part of, uh, whether it's a campus ministry for many of our students or just campus clubs or Greek life, most colleges and university will have those email addresses of their, their leaders up on those websites. And so it's a great opportunity. We tell our students, reach out to them before you visit campus, but now is a great opportunity to reach out to those people because they have time and just say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about coming to, to your school and your university, I'd be interested in your opinion on some of these things as I get to know it better. And so I think there's ways that, that we've taught our students that you can actually get to know a place without, without actually being there. And it was interesting, I was part of a webinar today where I was listening to some professional research and, and the two biggest concerns that seniors had, um, and it was really interesting to me because it wouldn't have been the concerns that I had um, their, their two biggest concerns were um, dorms, what do dorms look like and who am I going to be living with, and then academic facilities, what, what do the academic facilities look like. And so I think as you dig deep into those, you, you can do some of that research online. Excellent. What's our next question, Eric? So I think, I think the next question is, you know, it, and, and I'll kind of maybe pitch it over to Trevor, because it was something that he had mentioned earlier, um, you know, in this, in this sense of, you know, we, when he was talking about test scores, if, if I have this time, if we're on remote learning, if we're, we're in this extended place, 
you know, how, what can I do now? What, what, you know, you had mentioned build your academic resume. Like, mm -hmm. what are the things, you know, Trevor and then Rob, what are the things that, that I can actually be doing that might provide me greater opportunities to learn, to grow in my skill set, to do the things that I wanted to do, knowing that probably I'm not going to get to do that summer camp or that summer program or, you know, on those campuses or, you know, or, or whatever it might be. That's a really good question. Um, I think first and foremost, the whole concept of MOOCs, the massive open online curriculums that are available through edX or Coursera, um, this is literally the best time to start taking advantage of learning a new skill set or maybe refining something that you could be interested in. Honestly, I think it really starts with students and parents getting on the same page together and just figuring out what are the students' interests, what do they want to pursue in college, and then also this is a good time for parents to maybe have a heart-to-heart -heart with your student about what is our realistic budget, and maybe you can start designing activities together, searching for schools and looking for um, things such as the net price calculator online, which really helps a student and a parent kind of come on the same page to understand, all right, this school has exactly what I'm looking for. I'd love to pursue the program here. What is it going to cost? I mean, I was doing research with a student the other day on Bowdoin College, and they have a coastal study center. I guess they, they own a couple miles worth of coastline. And they do some really cool things there with students. And that's literally what she wants to do. So, you know, talking with students about what are their areas that they can really start to find interest in. I personally think that online MOOCs, those MOOCs, Massive Open Online Curriculums, are a great way to just learn a skill set, get a little bit deeper into that, that field and that career, and just see if it's what you're looking for. Uh, I am a huge fan of the MO MOOC programming. Uh, I sent out a link to uh, all of our families on programming that was set up by all of the Ivy League schools. And for those who know me, you know how lovely I think the Ivies are. Uh, <laughs> bottom line is, if, if I knew when I was a student in high school that if there was a topic that really jumped out and I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. I'd love to learn from someone who teaches at Harvard or Yale or, or, or Princeton or Columbia or wherever. What an amazing opportunity, oh, by the way, for free to do this. What a great opportunity for you to be able to learn from afar, not pay for it, to sample something purely for the sake of learning. You want to talk about sexy. That's what colleges say is sexy. Students who love to learn for the sake of learning. And if you are, are still stuck on the, what do I have to do to prove my worth to colleges? You've given yourself two strikes because you're thinking about this the wrong way. Colleges are going to love you one way or the other. Be the best representation of yourself that you can be. And if you do that, you're going to find that colleges are, are quite interested in you, that they love your personality and they love your perseverance and they love your dedication and they love that you try new things. Those are the types of qualities that students bring to the table that colleges love and respect. It's not which summer program am I supposed to take that colleges will like better? Good point. Yeah. I would also encourage along the same lines, this is a great time to talk to people outside of maybe the medical profession who are working from home, whom you could, you know, you have a, a your, you know, your mom knows an attorney and you're thinking about maybe becoming an attorney and you don't, you don't really know any. Well, Pick up the phone and have a conversation with this person and, and see if they'll give you a few minutes of, of their time or, or set up a Zoom meeting with them and, and share a couple of questions or concerns or ask them about their lives or what they would do differently. Let's talk to people who are professionals who do what it is you think you would like to do five or 10 or 15 years from now and get a sense of, well, what is that job really? And does it sound like they really like what they do? And what opportunities do they bring to the table? Uh, one of the things that Trevor and I are hoping to do as part of a, a brand new uh, summer boot camp that we're offering this year is bring in professionals from the medical field, bring in professionals from the law field, bring in professionals from the business field to talk about their experiences with students and give them the opportunity to ask their own questions in a real time environment. Coronavirus, notwithstanding, we'll see. Uh, we're hoping to run at the end of July. 
So these are all different things that you can do to become better informed about the opportunities that are available to you beyond college. I mean, after all, we're not going to college for the sake of doing it. We're going to college because we'd like to have some sort of, you know, wage earning career down the road and college probably affords us the best opportunity to do that. That hasn't changed. Yeah, guys, I mean, I think that's, that's some great advice. And, and it's, it's really interesting as you watch, you know, with the time, some students, if, if they are in a remote learning situation are finding that, you know, and I think it depends on where schools are at in the benchmarking process. I'm, I'm beginning, we're about three weeks in at my school. And what I'm finding is my students are finding the rhythm and they have a little bit of extra time. And so they are looking for those MOOCs. They're looking for, you know, online classes to build skills or to take classes that might allow them to go further and faster next year. They're also looking for those opportunities to just kind of say, hey, here's an opportunity I don't get at my high school. You know, how could I learn more about this or learn more about that? So I think you can do a lot of you know, really interesting learning right now. I think that, Rob, you're 100% right, you know, about talking to professionals. People have time. So tap into your networks, ask questions, do interviews. I think the other thing that's interesting, and it goes back to kind of if you can't visit a campus, the college kids are home and they have time, you know, and even some of the colleges in their admissions departments are providing the opportunities for students to call the admissions office and set up appointments with uh, with the college kids. You know, the college kids are at home, but they have that opportunity to set up a Zoom call and ask questions about the college experience and about their school. So a lot of the admissions departments are providing that. And then the last thing I would say to, to what you guys already said is, and I think you guys have hinted at it too and, and said it is, I'm having a lot of my students just because they have time to do the career tests. Um, we use Navion, so we have a lot of the career tests in there. We have Do What You Are, you know, which is the Myers-Briggs, Strengths Explorer, the Hollins Code. But then there's also online, there's Youth Sciences, there's other programs, you know, there's even the Enneagram, right? I think anything that the students can do to gain greater clarity about who they are in the process would be pretty phenomenal too. And, and those are the fun ones as a counselor. When, when you have those results, you get the great opportunity to talk through that with a student and then parents get to kind of affirm and confirm some of the things that they see in those results as well. I call it the aha meeting. It's a, it's a great meeting to have with the student. Yeah, it, and it changes everything too as you start looking forward, whether you are a junior, you know, and kind of looking at what those next steps are, or whether you're a senior and saying, okay, I'm in this. Am I, am I pursuing those right things and those right opportunities? Or do I, do I actually really know what, I, what I'm interested in? And so I think it is, you know, for those people. Guys, I, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, it's kind of been hinted at in the Q&A stuff. Um, I'm interested in, as, as I'm making this decision, and I'm thinking about my finances, you know, a, a month down the road, but, but even a year down the road. What, what are the things that I should be doing as I make a decision uh, you know, and making a wise investment, but then what are the things that I should be kind of thinking about depending upon what my job and employment situation is and what's going to happen, not, not only with taxes being pushed out to July, but then even some of this other stuff. Can you guys bring some, you know, clarity to, to, to that for the seniors? And then even for the juniors and the younger students, what should they be preparing for as we look forward? I'll take that one. So, with regards to finances, the best thing that you can do at the moment um, is to really communicate. If you're a senior and you've been admitted to a college, um, everybody's taking a hit right now. So you need to just inform the college's financial aid office of what is really happening in your life to see what they can do to perhaps make it a little bit easier for you to afford that college. And more specifically, I think it would be a good conversation to have with financial aid about you know, if this continues, what could this university provide us with a year from now if things don't change? And I prefer that you get that in writing. So maybe through an email, it definitely helps to have a discussion with financial aid as well. Um, but to get it in writing is good. So when colleges tell you that we have a, a budget that we give out every year for financial aid, it's finite. Um, if you have special circumstances that maybe income has changed or you have medical expenses, um, maybe you're taking care of another family member all of a sudden because they lost their job and you have additional outflow that you need to care for them. These are things that aren't mentioned in your financial aid application when you applied. So now it's time for you to update the schools with that. 
Um, I will say that a lot of students that are currently admitted to schools, um, and I've talked to quite a few families about helping them make their decisions, because jobs are uncertain right now, income is uncertain, there might be a lot of students that go to community college because they don't know how they're gonna afford this year. Um, and in that regard, there might be a lot of students that are on wait lists right now that'll be taken off the wait list and get admitted because of that as well. So this is just a year that we don't know what to expect, but we do see some things like that. Now, going back um, for juniors, um, there's something called your base financial aid year that you wanna become familiar with. So the base year is the financial year tax wise that colleges are most interested in to determine what type of eligibility you might have. So for grant money, um, everybody could qualify for a merit scholarship. It just depends on where you apply and what, whether they award uh, merit scholarships. So that's something to look for. Um, it was, it's funny because I was mentioning to Rob before this webinar, why is it that every student wants to go to the one school that's offered them the least amount of financial aid? Psychologically, I just don't get it, but uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Eric and I were having a conversation a few minutes before we went live. Uh, and even the two of us have, have somewhat differing opinions about you know, how all of this is gonna, is gonna play out and how, how bad is things, you know, are, are they going to get? Uh, how much financial aid is going to be available and through what schools and what institutions. There's a lot of guesswork going on right now. But as I told a family earlier today that was kind of bouncing around this very tough decision, you know, a young lady had four schools on her list. And strangely enough, Trevor, her top choice was the only one that didn't offer her a scholarship and what to do about that. So you're not kidding. This is a very common problem. If you do not put your hand out, no one can put anything in it. Let's start there. The second thing that both of these guys have, have talked to me about is if you ask for a blank check, you won't get anything. If you have a very specific goal in mind, this is how much money I need to pull the trigger on this decision and accept your offer versus the other schools that have made a better financial offer to me. If you can meet me halfway, if you can give me this amount of money, whatever this amount of money is, they're more likely to be able to look definitively at what they can do to help you and how bad they want you or how bad they want you for their particular financial situation and maybe make that call. Um, this is one of those rare moments where literally you hold as a, as a parent and a student, you hold the overwhelming majority of the cards. You don't hold them all, but you hold a lot of them. So exercise your right to ask for more as long as you realize you're not going to get the world but you might get more than you were offered the first time around. Uh, and if it's really a school that's worth spending a little extra money, go for it. Hey guys, um, one of the questions that was in here, and I think it, it, a lot of it has to do with the, the context of the situation. And, you know, you kind of get into each and every school that's a little bit different. And uh, the question was, how will um, this situation in, impact admissions for international students. And then I'd be even interested in, you know, that impact directly for international students. What's the trickle down effect for everyone else? Well, seeing as we had this conversation, Eric, I'm actually going to ask you to, to share your take and then I'll, I'll jump in because uh, I think I think you've got your finger on this one. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I have the opportunity, you know, our school has a fairly robust international student population. And so it is kind of checking in with them and, and, and seeing, you know, what's happening for them personally, but then also watching the, the, the college opportunities and what college admissions is, is happening. I, I, I have a belief and we're maybe starting to see it that depending on how long this goes, and then with the visa issues and then with travel issues and with some of these things that that um, the international admissions pool, you might say, or yield even at this point in time, I don't think it is for admissions. I think the yield will, will take a significant hit. Um, and so I think for international students, particular as they're making their choices, we have some international students who likely probably the majority of ours will probably not go home this summer. Um, and they'll just stay in the United States so that they can start at their college in the fall. 
there is a worry that if they go back to their home country that the questions of coming back will will be there or not. I think that the trickle down effect will, will definitely impact colleges. Some of the colleges, you know, like, um, you know, especially in California have built, um, you know, college, you know, their, their pool around, you know, anywhere from five to 20% of their population being international students, but then also in places like Boston, places like New York and, and other major metropolitan cities or international cities where you see that. And, and I think what, what's going to happen is, and Rob and I talked about this for international students now, like you have to figure out the details of whether I should go home, whether I should stay, what are the next steps? Can I defer? Can I do all those types of things? But it is going to have a trickle effect. And so a lot of students have been put on the wait list. I've heard from a number of colleges and have had many conversations that colleges have doubled the size of their wait list. And so my guess is the international student population, if that shrinks down, then it'll move into the wait list. Uh, the question will be on the back end of this for international students and international admissions, what's the long-term impact of, of some of this? Will, will it actually dry up? Um, it was already shrinking over the last few years, but will it dry up or will this just be a blip and it'll return to normal? Guys, please add. Um. I think that there's a number of factors going on here, and I'll, I'll be short and sweet as, as I know the majority of our, our participants are domestic. Uh, I'm expecting a short-term significant shift to the negative in this population, uh, especially knowing the majority of the overseas folks who come to the United States looking at schools like Berkeley and UCLA and Stanford and the like are from China. Uh, not only do we have strained relations? Not only did China already take their hit and probably are gonna take a little bit more, so what financial considerations do they have as purchasers? But knowing that we don't offer much in the way of price breaks to internationals, we, we desperately need those funds. So do I see a, a large swath of them saying, maybe we, we take a year unless it's Stanford or Yale or Princeton or one of their top three or four schools? Yeah, I, I do. In the short term, I see that being an issue and it will become a financial issue with our top 25 schools, but not something that I, I don't think we as a system can overcome, at least from that perspective. Trevor, maybe you can add a point of clarification because the, the system for international students in particular has been set up where, you know, a lot of times colleges will charge tuition plus, or, you know, if it's an in-state school, it'll be out-of-state tuition. They won't give financial aid. Do you believe that, you know, that even for international students who are able to stay and able to make the transition back in the fall, will, will they, you know, what, what should they even expect now, going back to your earlier conversations about financial aid, what, what would be, you know, some of the questions in regards to, how they should approach financial aid going forward too. Specifically for the international contingent? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, gosh, that's a, that is a good question. Uh, for the most part, they would be eligible for merit aid at private universities, um, but they typically are the part of the enrollment process that the managers look at when it, um, taking in international students is how it's going to help build their budget throughout that academic year when it comes to financial aid. And so they need to be able to offset a certain amount of full pay families with those who are going to be receiving financial aid. It's just part of their enrollment management system and it's part of how they choose. So if you've ever heard the term um, uh, need blind, that basically means that the school has no interest in how much money it takes to get you there based on your finances. We just want the student. Um, so from an international standpoint, I feel like it's a very good idea to maybe forego the schools that are well known or re reputed, or maybe they have a, the top names. But if you're interested in securing some scholarship money, maybe find schools that you'd be considered in the top 20% where they're going to throw some scholarship money your way, just knowing that the rest of the bill would have to be paid. So I'm a big believer in letting a school compensate you for the work that you put in throughout your time in high school. And you know, if it's a school that maybe not too many people know about, if it's a good fit for you, I say go for it. It's, to me, it's about the return on investment more than anything.
those are the majority of questions that I'm seeing right now, Rob, unless other people have them. Um, I've been responding to opportunity. This is it chime in or, or God forbid, Eric, Trevor and I take the, take the reins and we just start talking about stuff that, that we think is important for you guys to know. Uh, but ask, ask now or forever hold your peace. Um, and while those uh, opportunities come, uh, there's one uh, article that we all, I'm pretty much pretty sure all of us saw it in the last uh, 24 hours that talked about major changes to the University of California admissions. Um, I had a couple of my families call up in, in a bit of a panic and they're like, okay, what is going on? Uh, it, can anyone now get into the UC system? What does this mean? How does this affect me? Uh, my take, and you guys, please feel free to jump in, is this is a lot of noise signifying nothing. Uh, there are not going to be major changes in terms of admissibility, meaning the strongest students are still going to be considered. Just because we, we waive a standardized testing opportunity or we remove an A through G component because we have to go to a uh, a pass, no pass formula, uh, or how are we going to consider the value and efficacy of the AP exams that are being taken in, in a few weeks? Don't get crazy here. This is more about ensuring that the pipeline stays full for the University of California. This is more about making sure the dollars that go into those applications are still being received, because let's remember, uh, the top six most applied to schools in the United States of America begin UC. The top six, you can probably figure out which those six are. Uh, and of the top 10, uh, two more, which would be San Diego State and USC, uh, are in our state as well. So when we, if we strip out a lot of these applications, we lose a significant amount of revenue to these schools that some of them, believe it or not, are already running at or in deficits. So this is not as big a deal as, as maybe the LA Times article or the Chronicle have, have made out. I, I wouldn't I would panic. I would recognize that if you've been doing what you need to do all along, you're a competitive student, you've been taking competitive classes, you're getting competitive grades. If you were lucky enough to take a standardized test in the first semester of 11th grade, um, have you been demonstrating uh, an interest in things you enjoy in your extracurricular activities. If you've been doing those things, you're still going to have great essays that you can write based on your, your life experiences and who you wish to be and the characteristics you've developed over time. Nothing changes on that front, which means you're going to do at least as well as your friends who maybe didn't get the chance to take the SAT or ACT. So don't panic is the advice I would give you on this front. Eric, do you mind mentioning um, about the AP exams this year online? Yeah, I think I think, and somebody mentions. I, I I've been trying to kind of look it up on my phone that they they'd mentioned that some dates got released um, this afternoon, but I'm not sure about that. So the AP exams for people currently, um, what they've announced is that they'll be they'll be earlier this year um, than normal. And they're going to do them online and they're going to shrink them down to 45 minutes. And so what students are going to have to do is if they're taking more than one AP, they're going to have to really schedule them out, um, see what they look like. I think there's still a ton to, to be figured out and to be discovered. But um, College Board has been saying that they have the system and, and they've been doing the online testing for a number of years now. But to go this massive will be really interesting in this short of time and to really shrink and simplify the tests. Um, and I think that's what Rob, you know, kind of mentions even is, is what, how will people view those AP tests afterwards or, you know, those types of things. Um, what else do you know, Trevor? So I, I do know that the material will go up to, I believe what was covered in the classes up to the end of February or early March. Um, and also for those that are ready to take it sooner, there's, I guess, a sooner test date, but there will also be one a little bit later for those who aren't yet prepared. That's what I've heard so far. Yeah, the, um, the College Board actually released 
uh, if, if your school is using the standardized materials designed for AP readiness, it very specifically shows you exactly what chapters will be covered on this 45 minute at home open resource exam. So that has already been released. That's not likely to change in any way. The dates, like we've already kicked around, if, they're, if they haven't been released, they should be released within the next 24 to 48 hours. And yeah. there's going to be two exam dates for every single exam. That's about as much as I've heard. Yeah. So guys, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, you two was, um, and, and there's, I had to get some clarification on it today from the NCAA even and how they're going to look at it. Um, but with the, the UC system accepting, you know, and I've had a number of conversations with my friends who are in schools around the country, but then in, in particular here in California and with the UC systems accepting pass fail, how might that impact, you know, whether I am a senior or whether I am a junior, how might that impact not only admissions, but then how might that impact financial aid, especially with merit based being so tied to, you know, GPA oftentimes. And then, you know, I, I can kind of give people an update on if there's, if there's an interest on the NCAA stuff, because I got clarification on the pass fail there. Uh, my take is, is more of a guess than it is anything concrete. Based on what little I have seen and just common sense says, if we're in a situation, and this, by the way, goes for whether it's a high school or a community college, if we're taking a semester and saying, well, we're going to move it to pass fail and we're going to move all the credits forward or all the units forward and that's fine. And we're, we're going to count all that. That's great. What I do imagine in terms of sifting through quality of candidate is largely that's going to be ignored and we're going to look at the prior or post uh, grades and that's going to have a higher weight than what happened in this term that went pass fail. That's logical. It just makes sense to me because you can't really take any of that information and do anything substantive with it. I'm imagining if you're applying to a college that we're familiar with, it means you passed everything. So if everyone who's applying passed, it tells us nothing of, of any sensible data. So it means a greater reliance on what you did the year before or the semester after is what is almost required in this situation. I think, you know, for any of the athletes out there, I, I had to ask the question because this came a, across and I work with a lot of athletes. So if you're in that process, you know, of trying to figure out the NCAA um, pass fail because of the eligibility status, you know, where you might be and even the test scores, um, you know, I, I think the, the best advice I got from them is make sure you work with the college coach that you're working with. But unfortunately for the NCAA system right now, pass is the lowest passing grade at a school. So it'd be translated in eligibility at a school like mine, a, a, a D is the lowest passing grade you could get. So it would be, you know, it would be computed as a 2.0. So I think for athletes, if your school does go to pass fail and you're in the recruiting process with colleges and with the NCAA eligibility center, you just got to make sure you're proactive in the process with the coaches that you're being recruited by um, and that you that if you do need to put into in in an appeals um, for eligibility that you're proactive in putting in appeals because I'm also dealing with that in a situation with a senior who is hoping to take the March you know test um, you know to get eligibility and then we're also working with the juniors of what does this mean for you know even college visits in the fall you know the official visits in the fall and then some of the other things that come with NCA so I know not everybody here is an athlete but that's a little bit of a slice that I get to to be so if you are hope that's an encouragement can I maybe just mention something real quick I do know that a lot of schools already implement um, entry-level placement exams for students and I don't know if that's going to be something that they'll do to take it a little bit more seriously this time around just because of the dynamic of the pass fail but something to maybe look for is the those placement exams that the colleges that you're admitted to will ask you to take so we got some great information on the ap exams from one of the participants that uh they were posted on the dates were posted on twitter just a few minutes ago so if people want to check college board kind of get a jump start on the dates they can do that see they're listening to us good job yeah, yeah. Sophia, she's good. 
She's yeah. good. She's asking great <laughs> questions too. Uh, you know, there, there was a question, and I think a lot of this comes to context and preparation. I think you kind of hear the biggest questions being, you know, uh, grades, but then test scores, but then also getting to know a college by visiting it, and then also the finances. Is there, is there any worry that once my financial aid package comes in and, you know, my merit-based, you know, package comes in, that that could actually get, you know, that could be decreased by the time that school starts? Wow, that is a really good question. Um, and with respect to merit aid, um, think of that as a contract. The, the school admits you and puts it in writing that they're gonna give you, let's say $20,000 per year. So over the course of the four years, you're being awarded $80,000. Um, as long as you maintain your student responsibilities, which is maintaining a certain GPA, um, the school cannot take that away from you. And one other thing to kind of piggyback on that is, colleges endowments are really being looked at very closely now by those who can tax it. So there are some, um, realities now that colleges have to be able to spend a certain amount of their endowment to the students that are enrolled there. Otherwise, there's the likelihood that those endowments could be taxed. So I don't foresee any colleges pulling merit scholarships away. That would be a black eye um, in their name. But um, the one thing that I do imagine happening is because a lot of families' finances are being affected right now, there may be, and again, this is just speculation, but there may be a shift towards um, reducing the amount of gift aid through need-based financial aid. Um, and just, there's going to be a bigger gap that colleges won't be able to fulfill. Um, and so I know that that's a term that maybe a lot of you don't know, but um, I could send out information on how financial aid works and so forth. But um, I believe personally that the need for families regarding finances are going to go up tremendously and schools are going to react to that in some way. But merit scholarships should not change whatsoever. Guys, um, you know, I think for me, one of the questions is, um, you know, if I'm a senior and I'll ask the follow up question for the juniors and the, you know, the underclassmen after that. But if I'm a senior, what, what, how do I stay on top of this process going forward over the next, you know, really, if we use the traditional date of May 1, but what are you seeing with schools move that traditional date from May 1 to, to June 1 or even later? What would be a couple of your tips right now as, as seniors kind of manage, you know, the decision making process, the enrollment process and, and all that goes with it, um, you know, here going forward. And then I'll, follow, I'll ask the follow up question for the, you know, juniors and underclassmen after. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, as a senior, hey, look, first and foremost, it is a scary time. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. We all want to go out and we want to verify, did we make the right choice before we put the deposit in? Did we get everything we could in terms of our, our best financial aid offer? Um, but I also want to, to back up and say, you know, yes, there are a lot of schools that are moving to June 1 or even further to, to make their commitment. But here in California, the University of California, I believe yesterday stated they are not budging. It's May 1st. So I'm going to go off of the, we're still playing on a May 1st calendar. All of my students are going to be contacted and we're going to have conversations around the idea that we should be making up our mind by then. Even if that means we might have to put in a second deposit and see maybe we get more money from that second school and we end up losing that deposit if we have to. But in the long run, we get what we want at the price we want it. Um, I know, Trevor, I'll let you jump in from there. So the, the part that I struggle with in, in, star, in terms of commitments and so forth is, especially with the wait list, and there's so many students this year that have been waitlisted, and the emotional part of it, of committing to a school and sending in your deposit and meeting your dorm mate and figuring out your rooming situation, and then all of a sudden you hear from another school that you're really interested in, and, and now you're kind of in a situation where you have to either forfeit a deposit and go and get emotionally tied to that school or stay with your decision. But um, I agree with you, Rob. I think that May 1st is what we should be kind of counting on um, until there's more news, really. 
Uh, yeah, and I mean, I think the encouragement is, you know, and it, it's fun watching the chat box because a couple of the students are sending links and, you know, and, and sharing Twitter and all those types of things. And so it's it's that great reminder that, you know, if if we're if we're checking our email, following social media, you know, kind of check in those benchmarks um, along the way. I think there is that place where we'll get the information, be able to make the decisions. I think the, the encouraging thing for me is having talked to a lot of colleagues and friends in the college admissions side of things is that they're figuring it out as they go. And so it's kind of that trickle down effect. But guys, the follow up question is, I think everyone kind of says, okay, once this is over, we'll kind of get back to normal. Um, but if I'm a junior, or if I'm an underclassman, like it, 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 that, I don't, I don't believe there's going to be a back to normal. What might that new normal look like as, as we kind of live it out and really don't know what it will be? That's a tough question. Take so a guess here. That's, it's, that's it's, my suggestion. <laughs> what's that, Trev? I think now's a good time to start thinking of a gap year. That's one out. That's one out for sure. Um, there's going to be a lot of people. I, I think you both made mention of of the community college route as it's there, it's safe, it's either free or inexpensive. But let's also continue to speculate and say, well, we have a large, large population of students that go into the California community college system this year. What does admission to the UC system look like as a transfer two years from now? I got news for you. Two years from now, I would not be surprised, and I'm being completely serious with you, if the admission percentages look a lot alike for freshmen and transfers, that there is an almost reversal in our system that pushes because there are so many people in that system that number one, getting out in two years becomes nearly impossible. And number two, the admission percentages, especially at the more competitive UC schools, starts to drop precipitously as fewer and fewer students start applying as freshmen because of financial concerns, which then raises the admission percentage for freshmen. It's the complete opposite of what we've been seeing for the past decade or two decades. I think that's a very real possibility as early as two to two and a half years from now. I, I think, I think, you know, if I could add something and then um, maybe ask, um, you know, a final question. Um, is is I think what what this whole process reminds us of, and it goes back to you know the recession, um, is that you know being planned and and being a savvy consumer, a wise consumer, um, because college is pretty special. I think we we would all talk about that as being a pretty special experience and opportunity, and um, but but we're also in, investors, but then also consumers in the process. And so being a wise consumer in the process and being, you know, someone who's a learner in the process, I think the, the benefit is uh, in a lot of ways, it's, it's a, a reversal where, um, you know, the, the power is in your hands. The power is in your hands to get information, to make decisions, to pursue great opportunities, um, you know, in, in all of those things. Um, Guys, final question, and, and it gets to, you know, a question that Sophia asks here, you know, but final question overall, um, as we close out, like, how do we keep our minds about us, um, you know, in, in a time like this where, you know, we're at home, we don't know what's happening, the anxiety, the anxiousness, you know, what, what can we do to make sure that, you know, we, we are those, you know, wise consumers and those, those savvy investors in this process, but yet also excited about, you know, what's to come. Because I think even for some of this, and, and we won't know, is I think even the college experience might be a little bit different in the next few years. But, but overall, how can we keep our minds about us in, in this time? Um, I think there's there's actually a very good way of approaching this process, which is to not get caught up in, in the, the global environment or the regional environment or, or the city environment and, and to say, well, yes, you need to be aware of the universe around you, but in terms of this particular process, be a person of one. Recognize that you 100% still control your own destiny as it would be. Are you performing to the best of your ability? I call it the mirror test. When my family's 
and I have a sit down and I'm worried about, you know, a student's grades or an effort, I'm going to ask them, hey, are you passing the mirror test? And they'll look at me like I'm crazy and they'll say, what the hell is the mirror test? The mirror test is when you, you get up in the morning, and you go and use the restroom and you wash your hands and you look up in the mirror. What looks back at you? When you look in the mirror and you say, have I done the very best I can do today? Have you? Does that reflection look back and say, hey, man, you did everything you could. You know, I don't care if you got an A or a B or a C, to be totally honest with you. What I care about is you made maximum effort to be the best you could be that day. That means, did you do your homework? That means if you're going to take a standardized test, did you make every effort to do the best you could on that exam? Or did you just show up and wink? Same thing within an exam. Um, same thing with your extracurricular activities. I mean, how many people are going to say, well, there's no summer programs because they're all going to get shut down. And so they hang out in the pool all summer. How many students are taking control of their own destinies and their own situations and saying, okay, I'm going to step my game up and I'm going to do all of these things that we talked about this evening during this meeting to better understand what we bring to the table. How do we make the best opportunity for ourselves? And when you start writing down your essays and we look at those extracurricular activities and we get a real sense of, wow, this is a student who really put themselves in a position to be successful, they're going to be rewarded. It's going to happen, rest assured. So be the best representation of yourself you can be, the rest will solve itself. I wholeheartedly agree with Rob. Um, if I could just make any recommendation, I think now would be a great time to not so much talk about colleges and selectivity and that, but maybe spend some time with your student or students spend some time with your parent and get to know the career options. Maybe take some assessments like Eric was saying, use one of those um, links that he provided and um, work on getting to know your strengths. And I feel if you have that focus and you can really start to get a handle on what you're good at, um, things will start to coalesce in, the, in a way that you're finding yourself staying busy in areas that interest you. So um, I think that's a good way to keep your wits. Thanks guys. Thank you. Um, to everyone who uh, is, is still joining us, uh, I want to say, first and foremost, if you have additional questions or additional concerns that you didn't ask, uh, on the screen uh, that I've shared is uh, the email addresses for each one of us. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, for families who are here who still are not sure what to do, ask us for help. Uh, we're here to help you. Um, maybe you want to get uh, some more information on the summer program that we're offering. Reach out. We'll gladly share it with you. Uh, for our colleagues who are college and guidance counselors who decided to join us on this call, um, we miss you guys. We hope you're well. We hope you're safe. Uh, keep doing the great work that you're doing. Uh, if there's anything that, uh, that any of us can do for you, please ask us. We're here to help. Um, and with that, thank you. Um, please be safe. Stay vigilant. Um, it's a tough time for everyone here. Uh, you are not alone. And... Uh, we, we empathize with your situation. Uh, we are experiencing it with you and, and know that uh, eventually everything is going to be all right. Um, just keep plugging away and be the best representation of yourselves that you can, and we're going to be okay. Uh, so with that, um, to my colleagues, thank you again for your time, energy, and effort. And, thank you, uh, Rob. This was great. Eric, a pleasure as always, my friend. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Rob. Let's do it again. See Amen. you guys tomorrow, I guess. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Everyone have a wonderful evening.